Chile de Castro from the Delete Laws channel has been found guilty in court today and jailed. He has been taken into custody to serve a six-month sentence. Regardless of what you think about Chile, he is in a very vulnerable situation right now. Keep him in your thoughts. I hereby sentence you to 90 days in the Clark County Detention Center on count one, 90 days in the Clark County Detention Center on count two, to run consecutive for a total of 180 days in custody. Thank you. Sentence suspended or? Oh no, I'm going to start right now. He welcomes this. This helps his YouTube channel. He called the officers here in my courtroom to take kids. He called the, and he's not his up and down. I so apparently he hates every law enforcement officer in the United States. All right. Please stand up, sir. Are you finished with your request? For, so I believe the state's met their burden beyond reasonable doubt. I'm going to find you guilty of obstructing a public officer and resisting a public officer. Go to my marshal. He's a pig. Excuse me? I said he's a pig. Okay. Your Honor, I call Jose de Castro. Okay. Phone. He's an officer of the court. All right. Do we have everybody's phones? Are they off? 
All right. All right, this is the time set for the trial of State of Nevada versus Jose, Jose De Castro, 23 CR 013015. Is the state ready to proceed? Yes, we are, Your Honor. How many witnesses do you have? We anticipate one. All right, is the defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. All right, I have your request to convert counsel to standby counsel. I'm going to deny that request. Um, either you represent him or he should have previously requested a Feretta canvas to represent himself. That I just consider that a delay tactic, so that request is denied. Are you ready to proceed otherwise? I'm assuming you are. Yes, sir. All right, will the state please call the first witness? Yes, Your Honor. The state calls Brandon Bork, and he's in the ante room. Swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please be seated. State your name for the record and spell it first and last name, please. It's Brandon Bork. Brandon is B R A N D E N. Bork. B O U R Q U E. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Sir, good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, sir, how are you employed? I'm a police officer with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. How long have you been employed with uh, Metro? Just over eight years. Um, what is your, um, like, uh, what's your occupation there? Like, where are you assigned? I currently am a field training officer at Sergeant Area Command. Okay. And so are you a patrol officer? Yes, ma'am. That also trains um, newer officers? Yes. Okay. Um, were you employed with Metro? I, I'm assuming you are, because you've been employed for eight years. Back on um, March 15th of 2023. Yes, I was. Were you a patrol officer at that time? Yes, I was. As a patrol officer, do you wear a uniform? Yes, I do. Um, can you describe the uniform? It would be the same uniform I'm wearing today. Okay, so for the record, you're wearing um, a tan uniform with the logo of Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department um, located throughout your, your shirt. Yes. Okay. Um, as a patrol officer, do you have access to or utilize a marked patrol vehicle? Yes. And can you describe what the, this marked patrol vehicle looks like? It's black and white in color and it has the LVMPD's logo on all sides. Okay. And is it also equipped with like, lights and sirens? Yes. Okay. Um, and so you were employed as a patrol officer back on March 15th of 2023? Yes. Um, at some point in time, um, did you conduct a traffic stop um, while you were working in that capacity? Yes, I did. On that date? Yes. Okay. And was that for a vehicle um, bearing license plate 748Z, like Zebra, T like Tom, B like Boy? Yes. And what? why did you stop that vehicle? I had conducted a DMV records check on that license plate and it came back expired and suspended. And where is it that you stopped that vehicle? It was uh, 4155 South Grand Canyon, which was their target. Okay. Um, is that over on Flamingo and Grand Canyon? Yes. Okay, and that's here in Las Vegas, Clark County, Nevada, sir? Yes. And um, you indicated it was for uh, a license plate that was expired and suspended? Yes. Okay. Um, so when you initiated the traffic stop, um, what did you do or how did you do that? I approached the driver, let her know the reason for the stop, obtained her uh, identifying information, registration okay. insurance. Okay, um, and I forgot to ask you earlier, but pursuant to um, your uniform and as a patrol officer, are you equipped with a body-worn camera? Yes, I am. Okay, and do you also have a radio? Yes, I do. Okay, and are those items, both the body-worn camera and the radio, um, on your uniform today? Yes, they are. Okay, and is that how the body-worn camera and or the radio were on your uniform back on March 15th of 2023? Yes. Okay. And to your knowledge, was your body-worn camera functioning at that time? Yes, it was functioning. Okay. And so, uh, you made contact with the driver of that Hyundai? Yes, I did. 
um, would you, how would you characterize um, the nature of your encounter or the, um, yeah, the nature of your encounter with that driver? Uh, she was cooperative with me. I explained the reason for the stop. Um, she seemed confused, you know, not sure exactly how it had become suspended, uh, but she was friendly and cooperative. Okay, and she identified herself? She did. She had a picture of her license on her phone. Okay. And at some point, sir, um, did you go back to your patrol vehicle uh, to further your investigation? I did. And as you were, let me ask you this. Um, when you effectuated the traffic stop on this vehicle, where did you park or stop your vehicle in relation to the Hyundai that you were stopping? I parked approximately 10, 15 feet behind the stop vehicle. We ended up in a parking lot. Okay. And was the driver the sole occupant of the vehicle? Yes. Okay. And so when you returned to your patrol vehicle to conduct your further investigation, um, was the driver within eyesight? Yes, she was. Okay. And is it, is it your habit and custom and also your training to keep the individual that you are you know, dealing with within eyesight? Yes. And so at some point while you were still in your vehicle, in your patrol vehicle, um, did something occur that's causing you to have to testify before Judge Zimmerman today? Yes, I had uh, an unrelated person come over to start recording the traffic stop. Okay. And, um, we talked about your body worn camera previously, but did you activate your body worn camera prior to the traffic stop? Yes, I did. Okay. Or, you know, just before you initiated the traffic stop? I initiated the stop and then I immediately activated my camera. Okay. And how is it that body worn camera is activated on your uniform, sir? I have a battery pack that's on my belt in the front and I press the activation button, which is in the front. Okay. And so is it, is it just a tap of, of that activation button? It's a double tap on the front, yes. Okay. And how is it that you would stop recording? I would hold down that same power button. Okay. Um, or it can be turned off. There's a toggle switch on the top that slides on and off. Okay. Um, okay. And so you, the, your body worn camera was running as of, you know, the stop, the traffic stop being initiated? Yes. Okay. And so you described an um, unrelated individual um, coming over to, you know, your, your stop. Yes. Okay. Can you describe this individual? He was a white male adult. He was wearing a uh, bright colored hoodie and blue jeans. Okay. Um, that individual, do you see him here in court today? Yes, I do. Can you please point to him and describe something he's wearing? He's wearing a suit and a blue tie. Your Honor, please let the record reflect identification of the defendant. So ordered. And so, what do you do upon seeing this individual approach um, the driver of the vehicle you had stopped? Initially, when I saw him, he was just recording. And I ignored him and continued my records check. Then, when he came over to the driver and started speaking to them, I got out of the car, approached the driver, and told the caster to back up. Okay. When you first um, noticed, um, so you, you identified the un, unknown uh, or unrelated male subsequently, correct? Yes. And what was his name? Jose de Castro. Okay. Um, and that's the individual you just, you identified here in court? Yes. Okay. And so when you first laid eyes on the defendant, approximately how far away was he from, um, the driver of the vehicle in the Hyundai? Approximately somewhere within five to 10 feet. Okay. And, it's, and you indicated that he was recording? Yes. Okay. What did you see that led you to believe he was recording? He had his uh, cell phone camera pointed directly at me. Okay. Um, and so is that when, upon seeing him being that close to the driver, is that when you told him you walked up to the driver of the stopped vehicle and asked Mr. Uh, DeCastro to back up? Yes, once he started talking with the driver. Okay. And why is it that you did that, officer? Well, I can't have unrelated people uh, next to my traffic stops. I don't know if he's a dangerous person, armed. He could be a boyfriend of the stopped person. It's for my safety and the safety of the person I've stopped. Okay. Because you're also in charge of the safety of the individual that this unrelated individual is making contact with. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. Um, and so you saw it as an officer safety issue as well as a safety issue for the driver. Yes. Okay. And so when you approached 
Well, you said he was recording, the defendant was recording. At any time, did you tell him to stop recording? No. In fact, I told him he can continue recording. Okay. Um, he can continue to record given what? So as long as he backed up and gave him mm -hmm. an appropriate distance to work. Okay. And, and so when you asked the defendant to back up, did he follow your order? No, he did not. Okay. Um, and so what did you do next? I gave him three additional warnings to back up. Okay. And did he um, obey those orders? No, he did not. And what, if anything, did you do with the path, with the driver of the stop vehicle, the Hyundai? At that point, I chose to release the driver of the Hyundai and then focus my attention on Jose, Jose De Castro. Okay. Um, and for the record, officer, at that point in time, were you the only uniformed officer, the only officer um, present at the scene? Yes, ma'am. And so at this point, you were dealing with the stop driver as well as an unrelated individual and having to make contact or maintain visual both. Yes. And at that point, the defendant was not being cooperative. Correct, yes. Okay. So you release the driver of the Hyundai. What do you tell that person to let her go? I just uh, said that she was free to go, simply. And subsequently, did you turn your attention on the defendant? Yes. And can you tell Judge Zimmerman the nature of your interaction with the defendant um, after that? I ordered DeCastro to the front of my patrol vehicle while pointing at it and told him that he was detained. Okay. And what was the purpose of detaining him? For obstructing my initial traffic stop at the Monday. Okay. And did he obey your lawful order? No, um, he did not. Okay. And what, um, what happened next? We, uh, he continued filming me. I continued pointing toward my patrol vehicle, continued telling him he was detained. Um, all the while, he just continued shifting his body around, recording me on the phone, and refusing to go to the car. Okay. So what did you do in response? I uh, used my hand to escort him to the patrol vehicle. So I placed my hand on his shoulder, and at that point, he swatted my hand away. And what happened next? That's when I grabbed him by the shirt, and I spun him around, and then we ended up at the front of my patrol vehicle. We were both still standing. At some point, did you request additional units to respond to the scene? I did. That was before I grabbed him, okay. when I initially detained him. Okay. And, um, I'm sorry, uh, once you had him at your patrol vehicle, or the front, um, the hood of your patrol vehicle, what, what happened next? Uh, officer Dingley, another officer in the area, had arrived, and he came over to help me handcuff. Okay. And were you successful, or did the defendant cooperate in being handcuffed? He did not cooperate. Um, I told him seven times to face my patrol vehicle. He did not listen. I told him six times to turn around. He did not listen. It, was, it wasn't until I told him that he was going to go to jail that was the consequence of not listening that he allowed us to handcuff. Okay. And... Um, after he was handcuffed, but well, well, when he was handcuffed, was it just you and Officer Dingo present? Yes. Okay. Um, once he was handcuffed, what, if anything, um, happened next? He continued to argue with my partners, Officer Dingle and some other officers that were starting to show up. Mm -hmm. And then I focused uh, my roles in completing the report and calling the sergeant because he requested a supervisor. Um, and at some point, was he um, arrested for um, a count of obstructing a public officer? Yes. And also for resisting a, a public officer or resisting arrest? Yes. And was he, um, at any point in time um, during your interaction with him or your continued visual his interaction with other officers, did he cooperate with um, any of the officers present at the scene? No, he kept shifting around, and normally we have people stand still in front of our car, and I could hear him arguing with the other officers. You indicated you had your body worn camera turned on um, at this time? Yes. Did you have an opportunity to look at your body worn camera prior to court today? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, I were to show you a 
snippet of it. And Your Honor, we're going to be screen sharing through Zoom. Officer, are you able to see? There's not a screen over there, so I might have to bring mine over to you um, with the board's permission. Okay. <coughs> being shared on the screen as well as what's showing up on my computer screen um, is are two files, um, one labeled 416b.mp4, the other one labeled 468 um, number sign 1.mp4. Yes. Okay. I am just going to, and for the record, Your Honor, all body-worn camera footage have been um, disclosed to the defense well in advance of today's trial. I'm going to just show you a brief snippet um, of um, the one labeled 468 um, underscore number sign one dot mp4. Do you recognize what's depicted here? Yes, this is the initial Hyundai that I had stopped on the traffic stop. Okay. And so do you recognize this particular file um, as the body-worn camera of your interaction um, first with the Hyundai and then with the defendant on March 15th of 2023? Yes. Okay. And does this show the, the time that you activated your camera? Yes. Okay. The, similar to what you testified to uh, earlier? Yes. Okay. Um, and you've had an opportunity to see this entire mm -hmm. like, uh, 12 and a half minute long video, is that right? Yes. Does it fairly and accurately depict um, the traffic stop and also your interaction with the defendant on the date and time that we've been discussing? Yes. At the location that we've been discussing? Yes. Okay, Your Honor, I move to admit and subsequently publish um, the file labeled 468 underscore number sign 1.mp4. Judge? I have no objection. Admitted and published? Thank you.
I'm going to pause it at time stamp 9 minutes and 16 seconds. At this point, officer, do you see the unrelated male that you've been talking about um, enter camera view? Yes, I do. And um, could you just point to where he is in the, um, um, in the video on my screen? Yes, he's right here. And let the record reflect he identified um, a male wearing like a light colored blue jacket um, towards the middle of the screen. And is this the individual that you um, have been talking about, the defendant here today? Yes. Okay. Continue. Prior to what? Prior to the handcuffing. Okay. Um, 
Did you at some, we know this officer Dingle show up to the scene though? Yes. Okay, and do you know whether he had his body worn camera turned on? Yes, it was activated. Okay, and so what was, what would have been missed by the inadvertent um, turning off of your body worn camera would have been captured on officer Dingle's uh, body worn camera? Yes. Okay, and did I um, allow you to look at um, that video footage um, from Officer Dingle uh, this morning prior to testifying here today. Yes, you did. And did you have an opportunity to look at it to determine whether it was, in fact, the video um, related to this event? Yes, I looked at it and it was the video related. Okay. And so, um, then I turn your attention now to the video labeled 416D or dot mp4 and i'm just gonna it says four minutes six eight oh i'm sorry is that b or b four one six b not mp4 okay or eight um and okay i just played the first 13 seconds um but actually i'm gonna fast forward Now, for the record, the video is upside down. It recorded upside down? Yes? Yes, it did. All right. Actually. Why would it record upside down? Um, Ma'am, there's a setting in the application where you can rotate it. This officer may not have checked that beforehand. Okay. Um, stopping or starting at 454 um, timestamp on the video that we've been talking about. Um, do you recognize what's depicted, at least in this still portion? Yes, this is uh, me and DeCastro in front of my patrol vehicle. Okay. And so, to your knowledge, after having watched this, does this fairly accurately depict um, your interaction with the defendant um, on March 15th of 2023 as caught on camera by Officer Dingley's uh, body mark camera? Yes. Move to admit 416 B or 8. Uh, no objection. Do you know if it's an eight or a B for sure? It looks like a B too. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I lose. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, four sixteen B dot MP four will be admitted and published. Thank you. And I'm just going to start from four fifty four. Um, and I'll may I approach you on that. Can we move the water bottle so you can see it too? Of course. Thank you. Do you need come on? You can. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody rotate it so it's right tied up?
He told them about that. Just to Okay, I'm going to stop it at 11.35. So, officer, um, did the body-worn camera uh, portions that we played, um, or that I played, fairly and accurately depict uh, your interaction with the defendant on March 15th of 2023? Yes, it did. Um, concerning... Um, I just want to talk with a little bit about what was depicted in the video. In the video from your body worn camera, it shows you know the, the state of your stop with uh, the Hyundai driver. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. And at some point prior to you making contact with the defendant, you noticed him kind of recording further away from the vehicle, correct? Yes. Yes. And at that point yes. in time. You didn't have a problem with that. You didn't really approach the defendant yet, correct? Correct. It was when he started making contact with the driver, your stopped uh, driver, um, that you approached him and asked him to back up. Yes. And at some point in time in the video, it's recorded, you told him that he is allowed to record, but he just needed to back up. Yes. Okay. And what was the reason for you trying to maintain, one, the lack of uh, no contact with the stopped person, and two, um, trying to gain distance between the defendant, yourself, and the stopped driver. My first intention is I wasn't trying to delay my traffic stop any longer than it had to be. I was trying to make it as short as possible for the driver. And then the second was for officer safety. What we're taught in the academy is that uh, for a normal human's reaction time with open ground, anything within 21 feet, um, that suspect would be able to charge an officer without them being able to react in time. All right. And at that point in time, you were the only officer present, correct? Yes. Okay. And when he began, or when the defendant um, failed to obey your command to back up, that's when you decided to engage him? Yes. Okay. Um, Thank you. Good morning, officer. How are you? Good morning, sir. I'm well. How are you? Very well. Um, how many feet did you order the defendant to back up specific, uh, specifically? I never had an opportunity to give him an exact distance. Uh, how far back did you intend to have him back up even if you didn't express that? In the background of the video, you can see that there was a parked semi truck and a light pole. I would have directed him somewhere in that area, which would have been outside the 21 feet. Your testimony is you never told him an exact distance to back up, correct? Yes, he never allowed me to. What do you mean he never allowed you to? I asked him to back up and he continued arguing with me, so I can never specify exact distance for him. But you had time to give him five commands to back up, is that correct? Yes. Your testimony is he never backed up when you were giving him commands, is that correct? If he backed up, it may have been inches, but he didn't substantially back up. 
and you just reviewed the um, body worn camera from your, your chest. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. You didn't notice him backing up every time you uh, directed him to back up? He did not back up. So you backed up zero feet, in your opinion? It's not video? zero feet. What was that? He didn't back up zero feet. He was moving his feet. As to exactly how far he moved back, I don't know. But it wasn't substantial. What would have been substantial, in, in your opinion? Or, or what do you mean by that? I would have guided him if he wasn't arguing with me back toward the light pole in the park semi truck. And what happened again would have been outside of the 21 feet. That was so, my goal. So, in your opinion, you have the ability, or you would in any traffic stop, ask somebody to look back 21 feet. Is that correct? Yes, for our training. And what was that training? That uh, while we're conducting lawful activity, we're allowed a reasonable distance to conduct our activity. But where do you get that 21 feet number from specifically? That's taught to us in the academy. It's based on reaction time, normal human reaction time to a threat. So your position is anytime you're engaged in any law enforcement activity, you would create a 21 feet perimeter? Not necessarily. It depends on other environmental factors such as obstacles and barriers. So your testimony is that every time you conduct a traffic stop, as long as there's no barriers, you would order a pedestrian to back up 21 feet. Is that correct? I would, yes. Okay. What training do you have in regards to the First Amendment? It's standard academy training. Can you explain what that entails? Usually includes a classroom setting, a PowerPoint taught by a police officer, a academy officer. Uh -huh. Do you remember receiving that training specifically? Yes. How long ago was that? When I was first employed about eight years ago. Do you have any follow-up training? Specifically on First Amendment, we've had some follow-up training uh, regarding First Amendment auditors. Okay, can you explain what that follow-up training was? The follow-up training was just uh, a refresher on the First Amendment and how the department wants to handle or react to First Amendment auditors. In that training, did they explain any case law governing how many feet somebody has to move back or anything like that? Objection, Your Honor, at this point um, of relevance. I think it's beyond the scope of you know the charges that you are to determine guilt um, on at this time. Can you tell me what's the relevance? Yes, Your Honor. Um, he detained the defendant after issuing commands back up a particular distance. He's testified he's received training. Um, I should be entitled to cross-examine him about what that training is and how he's coming up with uh, the specific numbers he's using to, to issue. I think her objection was with respect to the case law that you're inquiring about. Your Honor, our position is if he is issuing commands that are contrary to that case law and he's been uh, trained on that case law, then there can't be an obstruction of justice. So I'm going to sustain the objection and ask you to move along. Have you had any prior issues um, enforcing the First Amendment? No. Um, prior to this event taking place, had you heard of Jose de Castro? No. Do you recall when you first heard about First Amendment auditors specifically? It would have been in the academy. So that was when you were first trained? You, you had heard about the auditors back then? Yes, when we were learning about the First Amendment, they would typically bring up uh, issues that might be a frequently seen thing. And First Amendment auditors are, are typically the ones that we encounter when there's First Amendment claims against us. Do you have any belief that First Amendment orders are likely to be violent? Objection. Relevance. What's relevance? Uh, I'm only concerned with Mr. De Castro. Okay. Your Honor, um, one of the legal issues that 
question here is whether or not these commands are reasonable. I, I think that it has to be based upon his past experiences in training. Sustained. Um, during this traffic stop in particular, what specific factors uh, led you to believe there might be a, a, a danger to officer safety? Based on his proximity to my driver, based on his demeanor being argumentative, based on his physical demeanor, his veins were popping out of his neck as he was yelling at me. You can see his veins popping out of the neck from your back where your vehicle is. When I was at the driver's side window, I could see that, but not at my car. So when you see him walking out from, from your car, what is your specific concern regarding officer safety at that point in time? Well, it's, it's my safety and the safety of the driver. I don't know who this person is. I've never met him before. He could be peaceful, he could be violent, I just don't know. There's so many unknown factors. And I also have a responsibility to protect that driver. If I were in that driver's position, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't want to be approached by some random person recording me, interviewing me. Did you ever ask the driver their opinion about whether they wanted him there or not? No, my Is first step was relevance. Sustained. Was your primary concern him speaking to the driver or him, him not backing up allegedly? My primary concern was safety. I don't know if he was armed or what his intention was. Do you presume someone is armed and dangerous just because they're in public? I can't rule out that he's unarmed. But you had no reason to believe he was armed on this occasion? No, nobody had told me he was armed, and I didn't see any weapons visible, but he was wearing clothing that could have easily concealed weapons. So when you first came upon the scene, you were um, in your vehicle uh, typing on your computer, is that correct? Yes. And what were you doing uh, in relation to that traffic stop at that point in time? Conducting a background check to see if uh, her license was valid to see if she had any criminal history to help me make my decision whether to warn her or issue citation. You stated your belief that the driver was entitled to privacy? I did say that. And, and what do you mean by that? Instead of continuing to give him commands to back up, I said something different uh, to try and help him understand. She, she's really not entitled to privacy, but she's entitled to safety. So your explanation is that you said that because you were just trying to convince him to back up, not because you believed? Yes, if I continue to give the command to back up and he's not listening, I can't expect something different to happen if I just keep saying back up. In, in your police report, um, do you recall referencing the fact that he had due notice in your opinion of what you were commanding him to do? Yes, when I gave him four commands to back up those due notice. But you'll agree with me that he did not have notice as to the distance you wanted him to back up, is that correct? That's correct. Approximately how long uh, were you issuing these commands him before you decided to take it? Approximately 15, 20 seconds. And your testimony is you didn't have any time during that entire back and forth to tell him a specific distance to back up to? Not time, but no opportunity. Okay. How so? Well, every time I tried to speak with him, he would argue he wasn't listening at all. So if he's not understanding back up, how would he explain something that was more complex? Well, what was preventing you from saying back up to a particular location? First, I would want him to back up, and then if he didn't back up far enough, I would give him an exact location. Okay. But you never did, correct? No, I never did.
Did the defendant's verbal comments towards you influence what you decided to do that day? No. On the video, did you see that um, the point in time you decided to detain him was uh, specifically after he made an insulting comment towards you? Um, it, that wasn't why I chose to detain him. I realized that he wasn't going to back up at that time. His comments didn't make you angry at him? No. In, in your um, review of the video just now, he had both hands in front of him the entire time. Is that correct? No, at one point he reaches uh, toward his back pocket to pull out his second phone. Um, did you quickly see that it was a second phone he was going for? Yes. Okay. So once you see him produce the second phone in his hands, uh, he's obviously not reaching for a weapon, is that correct? At that time, no, he wasn't. What time of day did this occur at? If I remember correctly, I think it was around 4.30 in the afternoon. And this was in a broad public place? Yes. Does the fact that this occurred um, in broad daylight in public influence your, your decision making as far as issuing commands to the defendant? Uh, it could. In this particular case, it didn't. And why is that? There was nobody around us other than me and the driver and DeCastro. Um, you testified he swatted your hand away. Is that your testimony today? Yes, that's the best way I can describe it. Um, and you saw his arm do this or you just felt it? I saw it and felt it. Um, do you recall in your police report uh, stating that you did not believe his intent was to harm you? Yes, I wrote that. Okay. And what is your basis for uh, reaching that conclusion? Well, he could have been charged with battery on a police officer, which would have been more severe. But I wasn't, I didn't think his intent was to hurt me, so I didn't charge him with that. Uh, you testified today that one of the things you were concerned about was him not going over to your vehicle. Is that true? Yes. Will you agree with me that he actually did walk over to your vehicle at some point during the interaction? Yes, but it wasn't reasonable the amount of time it took him. What would be a reasonable amount of time? Asking him to step in front of my car and then doing so immediately. And how fast is it immediately? This isn't based off of time, my response. It's just based off of interaction. Uh, I, had to, I had to tell him he was detained multiple times. And I made it clear what he was detained for. I said he was detained for obstructing. And I gave him several commands to step in front of my car. So I, I would think a reasonable person would walk over to my car, and then we'd have a conversation there. And how specifically did his presence obstruct your ability to complete the traffic stop? Again, I don't know what his intention is. I don't know if he's armed. All I saw was him recording, which and I had no issue with. I told him I had no issue with. At some point in time, if I were to issue a citation to the driver, my focus would be on the driver and what's inside her car. At that point, I hadn't pulled her out. I hadn't pat her down. I don't know if she has any weapons in the car or what her intent was, if there was anything underlying. So my intention on having to cast her back up was so that I didn't have split attention. He was too close for me to have split attention. So what are the things you stated that you were uh, concerned about, I guess, for a a safety point of view was that he didn't identify himself. Is that true? No, I didn't care about his identity until I had him detained. Okay. Um, at any point 
during the, I guess, detention of the defendant, did you pat him down to determine he didn't have any weapons? I did. Okay, and when was that during the uh, duration of the interaction? That was immediately after handcuffing. Okay, did you discover any weapons on him? No, I did not. From your police car, while he's walking up, you can essentially have a complete view of his movements and what he's doing at that point in time. Yes. And you never saw him uh, during that time period before you uh, got out of your car and reached for any weapons or anything like that? No. Were there other individuals around the traffic stop other than the defendant and the driver? Not that I can remember. Do you recall anyone walking through the scene and asking about the restaurant next door? I don't remember that. But your testimony is if uh, there was someone else on the video, you would have been ordering that person to back up 21B? I would have first asked them to back up, and most people do. And then if they did not comply, then I would give them a specific area to back up to. You ordered him not to speak to the driver, is that correct? Yes. Well, I remember asking him to back up. I don't remember if I specifically asked him not to speak to the driver. I think I, think I may have said don't talk to her or something to that effect. Did he speak to her before you got out of your patrol vehicle or afterwards? Before. I saw DeCastro filming. I stayed in my vehicle, continued my business. Then when I saw him speaking to the driver, that's when I exited. Did you see him speak to the driver after you exited the vehicle at any point? I don't remember if he spoke to the driver after I exited. At any point, did you hear specifically what he may have said to the driver? No, I was too far away and it was windy. Is your position that any time you're engaged in a traffic stop, nobody can speak to the driver? They can speak to them at a reasonable distance. And is that 21 feet? It could be, it could be shorter, it could be longer. It, again, depends on the environment, totality, the circumstances. Do you think people can easily verbally communicate it? 21 feet? No, not without shouting. Did at some point the defendant inform you that he was a member of the press? He did. Did that influence any of the orders you chose to give or not give to the defendant? No, it doesn't matter. Why does it not? What is your basis of that statement, I guess? Media, reporters, and standard citizens, they treat them all the same. So you becoming aware that somebody is a member of the press does not um, affect your uh, decision making in reference to your First Amendment training? Uh, no, and how was I to know that he was a member of the press. Whenever I interact with members of the press, they usually identify what station they're with or a group that they're with. They usually have some sort of identification and badge. And we have good relationship with the press out here. They don't approach us the way that DeCastro did. Are you familiar with the difference between traditional press or um, independent media? Yes, but again, the independent media would approach us more respectfully than DeCastro. Is your opinion that traditional media has different rights than new media, independent media? Objection, Your Honor. At this point, I think we're well beyond the scope so of thank
and court's indulgence, I apologize. So your testimony is, uh, if I recall correctly, that you received First Amendment training um, when you initially went through um, your officer training. Yes. And then you received one follow-up after that. I can't, no, it was more than one. I don't know exactly how many. Uh, typically that training is annual. And your testimony, just to reiterate, this is the first time you've experienced a, a First Amendment issue of this nature in, in your career? Objection, I believe I objected to that question um, when it was posed as like a violent encounter and it was sustained. And I also objected on the grounds of relevance. Um, as the court indicated, what we're concerned about is his interaction with the defendant specifically. Um, and so I, I object. Sustained, I'm only concerned about this interaction Uh, do you recall during your interactions with the defendant that you told him that you believed First Amendment auditors often pull out guns and shoot people? I didn't say that they often do that. Do you recall what you said? I don't. I would have said that he was a stranger to me and that officers get ambushed all the time. It could have been a First Amendment auditor. It could have been a regular citizen. It could have been a cook from one of the places nearby. I, I wouldn't have specifically said that First Amendment auditors are at higher risk. And uh, again, just to reiterate, uh, your testimony is that... Objection. I mean, anytime it's purposed as just to reiterate, I feel like I should object on an ask and answer ground. And I'm not, just to, to hear it, but it just sounds like a reiteration of the question that I've previously asked, so my objection is ask and answer. I'm going to ask this question before I rule on your objection. Okay. Again, I'm just trying to clarify because I think this point was ambiguous, but do you recall the defendant telling you that he was a member of the press uh, during the interaction with the defendant? Ask and answer. No further questions, Your Honor. you direct? No, thank you. Thank you, officer. You may step down. Yes, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Does the state rest? At this point, we do. Does the defense have any witnesses? Your Honor, I call Jose DeCastro. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Would you be seated? Mr. DeCastro, before you testify, I'm obligated to inform you that you have the right to testify in this proceeding, but you also have the right to remain silent. And should you choose to remain silent, I may not hold that against you in making my decision. Do you understand that? I do. And do you still wish to testify? Yes, I do. All right, please go ahead. You have a YouTube channel? Yes, I do. Can you um, give some insight into what that channel was about? Objection, relevance. What's the relevance? Your Honor, the relevance is that we're presenting a First Amendment defense, and the defendant is a member of the press. Um, there's different standards for First Amendment rulings where there is public policy at issue. Um, he, he can give insight into that. I'm going to allow it for a bit and see where it goes. Yes, I do have a first. I, I do have a YouTube channel, and the reason I have a YouTube channel is because of how many cops kill people every year, how many cops hurt, maim, torture, rape, and kill people every single year. It's such an epidemic that the rest of the world, I get thousands of emails saying, "Only in America does this happen." I started filming cops because when I was cheated in 2002. Objection no, at this point. Uh, relevance. Well, this is the British Greenland member of the press. This narrative. To, so, can you ask him a question? Yes, Your Honor. What type of films do you make for your YouTube channel? I only film police in their official capacity. I'm known across the country and across the world. 
And why uh, do you engage in that type of building? So I'm going to ask you, Mr. Need to direct your questions about the incident in question. The reason I was filming this report that day? Objection, Your Honor. Oh, oh sorry. So there wasn't a question posed. So oh, I I'm not what it's Mr. Called. DeCastro, um, on the date in question, why did you approach that vehicle? I was filming that cop because that's what I do for a living. I am a member of the press and I invoked my right to be press. In, I always invoke my right to be pressed within the first 10 seconds of engaging with police, and I have thousands of videos to prove this. So this is how you make money? This is not how specifically I make money. I make money from selling legal documents to people. Okay, go ahead. Do you recall the officer telling you to back up? Yes, I do. And what did you do after he told you to back up? I took a couple steps back. I just showed him that I was willing to back up a little bit. However, if I may, in Arizona, they created a 10-foot law. Objection, relevance, we're not in Arizona. It's the state of Nevada. So I'm gonna allow it, because I think that goes to why he kept saying 10 feet in the video, even though um, I will take judicial notice that you're not in the state of Arizona, you're in the state of Nevada. Well, a federal judge struck it down, Your Honor, and what- Stop. Can you ask more questions? Yes, Your Honor. Um, approximately how many feet did you back up? I backed up a foot or two. I was at least 10 feet away from that car that the driver was pulled over in. And when you spoke to the driver, what did you say? Just after she was okay. The, the reason I filmed police is because they abuse people so often. Do you recall the officer telling you not to speak with the driver? Yes. And did you... Uh, make any statements to the driver after that command was given? Absolutely not. Did the officer ever give you a specific distance to back up to? No, he didn't. If he did, would you have complied with that? Sure. Did you believe you were complying with the officer's commands? 100%. I also informed him I'm a member of the press and a constitutional law scholar that this is what I do. Do you recall the officer explaining to you why he decided to arrest you? There's several parts to the reason why he said he was going to arrest me. He said he was going to arrest me because I wouldn't turn my head a certain direction. If I didn't turn and face the car with my head, that he would place me under arrest instead of just giving me a ticket. Do you recall him explaining why he decided to detain you before he arrested you? He decided to obtain me because he said I was obstructing, which from my understanding is a physical act where I would have to get in the way. He said that the driver deserved privacy. I believe my First Amendment rights are not up for feelings. Did he explain to you that the basis of your detention was related primarily to the issue of privacy or the issue of you backing up? Well, I think from the officer's testimony, we can see that he's scared of the driver, scared of me, scared of everything. They teach them to be afraid of everything. So I had two cameras out. It's identified as a member of the press. I'm sorry, repeat the question. I, I want to get it specific for the record. Sure. Um, the question was, did the officer explain to you that the basis of your detention was because of you not backing up or because of the privacy issue of the driver? It was both. He said that told me to back up, I backed up a little bit, then he said, she deserves privacy, and then I told him to go get in your car, little doggy, and write your ticket. And at that point, his face turned beet red, and his veins and his neck stuck out, because we were over 20 feet away, and you had to holler to hear each other, because the wind was probably 30 miles an hour. Did you at any point um, attempt to hit any of the officers involved? No. Absolutely not. Did you uh, intentionally swat any of the officers? Absolutely not. He was giving me unlawful commands. I should not have been detained after I identified as a member of the press. If he ever reached a hand out towards me, I wrestle and teach MMA and I have for 30 years. So it's just a natural reaction as I'm retreating from somebody. If I may have put my hand up, as he said, as he testified himself, I certainly am a law abiding citizen. I don't break the law. So I would not have tried to assault an officer under any circumstances. 
is it possible that uh, during the interaction there was inadvertent contact between you and the officer? Sure, he decided to go hands-on with me when he was giving me unlawful commands, and there was absolutely no reason for it. I was willing to comply with anything he asked within reason, because I don't want to have a fist fight with another street with another man on the street. Do you recall the officer ordering you to go to his patrol vehicle? I do. And what did you do in response to that? Initially, I told him no, but then when he began to get physical with me and start to grab me and touch me, I said, okay, I'll go over to your car. His car was 35 feet away. I then led him to his car. It's on video. You can see it. I would walk right up to his car, and then he insisted still on grabbing me. After he saw me pull out an additional phone, which that's what press people do. We have lots of cameras on us. And did you inform uh, the officer that you were a member of the press? Oh, several times. There's, it's, in the, it's in the transcripts. I've transcribed them myself several times. I told him I'm a member of the press. And did you explain to the officer that um, you have a background in constitutional law? Yes, I told him I'm a constitutional law scholar, which was a moniker given to me by other people who are also, they have their own channels, their own press. And that's what some other lawyers on another channel called me three years ago. And I since adapted the moniker. And just to get some I guess, further background, were you looking for a police to report on this particular day? No. No, there's, there's, the cops hide on the side of the road so you pull people over. It's pretty regular in our country. I was just in the parking lot there. I saw that. Mr. Bork had somebody pulled over, concerned for her safety, I began to phone. And why do you think um, that law enforcement traffic stops are relevant to the public? That's where most people get killed. Section relevance. Who's doing that question? Who's just right? Who's doing I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Steve, I have no questions for this witness. Thank you. Sir, you may step down. This is Ben Trust? Yes, sir. All right. Any argument by the state? Your Honor, the state uh, asks you to find the defendant guilty of both the obstructing a public officer as well as resisting a public officer charged against him. Um, the video very adequately portrays, and I don't think it's disputed by the defendant, um, the, what the context was of the interaction with the officer. Um, I would venture to say that had the defendant just complied with the original order to not engage with the driver and to back up, we wouldn't be here. He wouldn't have found himself further engaging with Officer Moore. Um, this is not a First Amendment issue. Um, as you heard over and over and over again um, on, on the video, Officer Bork did not have a problem with the defendant recording. It was a, it's, not a, it's not a First um, Amendment issue, it's an officer safety issue. Um, here, you have an officer who conducted a lawful traffic stop. You saw the nature of the stop. There was no animosity between the officer and the driver. It was rather peaceful. They were engaged, banter back and forth. Um, he would have, he, as he testified, he was trying to determine whether he was going to cite her or let her go with a warning. Um, and then you have an individual, the defendant, introduce himself to a situation. Traffic stops, Your Honor, are inherently dangerous, particularly in, in crowded parking lots. Uh, I guess anywhere, you know, I would venture to say. This officer had, was reasonable in thinking that anyone who would approach in the manner that the defendant approached um, this, his scene um, would have a reason to fear for his safety or at least be suspicious of this individual's motives coming in. The officer had no problem with the recording. The officer had no problem with the defendant observing. It was when he inserted himself into this lawful detention that was occurring with the Hyundai driver that the officer turned his attention onto the defendant. This is not a First Amendment issue. This is an individual who took his work, what he perceived to be his rights, too far. The officer was well within his right as well as acting reasonably when he asked him to back up. That 21-foot rule, it, it, it's, it's appropriate. He said that was the training that they received um, in terms of the distance that's allowed for someone who needs to, to do them harm. It's a threat as, um, assessment. Um, we don't know when the defendant approached whether he had a, a gun concealed, whether he had a knife 
um, concealed, whether he had other weapons. And you'll hear multiple times in the video, Officer Bork yelling, stop reaching, stop reaching. This is an unknown, you know, when defense counsel asked Officer Bork all of these questions about how it is that you do this, and Officer Bork kept responding, it depends on the situation, it depends on the totality of the circumstances. Here was an officer acting alone, individually, engaged one-to-one -one with a driver. Um, but he had no problem with you, have, you insert another individual who, who enters the scene um, in the manner that the defendant did, um, and now this officer's um, attention is going to be divided. He had every reason to fear for his safety as well as, as that of the driver. I, again, if he had just complied with the officer's commands or demands to back up, and you know, a lot was made about hey, he didn't have an opportunity to tell the, um, the defendant exactly how far back. As the officer testified, even just with the, hey, back up, the defendant didn't back up, not willingly. That's why the officer had to continue to engage with him and force him um, into, this, into the situation. Had he complied, he would not have been charged with obstruction. Had he complied initially, he would not have been charged with the resisting. The officer was, I mean, you are gonna have to assess credibility. There's nothing in the video um, or, or Officer Bork's testimony that would cause the court to question his veracity or his intention for that matter. Um, he was very honest in that he didn't believe the defendant wasn't trying to harm him necessarily with the squat. That's why the defendant wasn't charged with the battery upon a, a, a protected person or a police officer. Um, but that squat, Your Honor, I would argue, was meant to resist at that point in time, the officer was trying to detain him and subsequently arrest him on the on the obstruction um, as depicted in the video. And so at this point, I think we proved by um, beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did hinder um, Officer Bork's investigation um, and detention of the, the Hyundai driver and that he resisted um, uh, the officer's um, arrest and um, or attempt to arrest him. And so we would ask that you find the defendant guilty of both. All right, thank you. Ben? Yes, Your Honor. Um, so first of all, you cannot obstruct an unlawful order. Um, I disagree with the state that this is not a First Amendment issue. Uh, the First Amendment in, in this context actually has two parts. There's the filming and the right to film within a, a reasonable distance. Um, the case law in all the federal circuits, Your Honor, it, there's no 21 feet um, rule that's been approved by any court of which I'm aware. Uh, that there is a 10 foot rule. Um, that seems to be the rule that is applied by most of the federal circuits in interpreting the First Amendment. Um, I, I submitted a bench brief that, that kind of goes through that issue if, if the courts had a chance to review that. I don't have that. Okay. When did you submit it? Um, it was submitted yesterday, Your Honor. I mean, at this point, I would move to strike because it, it's untimely. Um, but I got it this morning when I walked into court. Go ahead. So the officer's testimony to that, there's essentially this 21-foot distance where anybody can charge an officer and cause physical harm to an officer. If that is applied universally, Your Honor, it, it totally uh, diminishes and violates the First Amendment. That is as the officer testified, a 21 foot radius that he could attempt to impose, I believe his testimony was, anytime there's not an obstacle between a, a person and um, somebody that law enforcement is interacting with. And, and that's just not what the law requires, Your Honor. The First Amendment gives uh, their, their media, new media, old media, it gives uh, individuals the right to film government agents. There's um, no dispute that that's the requirement. And, if the officer is applying this 21 foot uh, circumference to all law enforcement interactions, he's effectively eliminated the ability to film uh, law enforcement going about their, their duties. Um, the commands to not talk to the driver are also um, not, not based on any uh, actual legal justification. There's no right to privacy in, in public, um, whether you're engaged with law enforcement or not. There's uh, no requirements or no statute, no law that uh, citizens can't interact with drivers that are um, interacting with law enforcement. Um, so what's, what's taken place here, Your Honor, is that this officer has taken it upon himself to 
essentially uh, act, act as the uh, le legislature um, and created these rules that have no basis in um, in any law and in fact are contrary to the First Amendment. Um, again, you can't obstruct an unlawful demand, so uh, there is no obstruction of justice here. Um, resisting arrest, Your Honor, the court can see the, the video. Um, essentially what happened is he walked over to the front of the vehicle. There was some dispute about why he was being detained. That was discussed. Um, it, the case law in that area, Your Honor, is that uh, if it's an unlawful arrest, which it was in this case because they're uh, essentially arresting him for uh, violating these unlawful orders that they're um, pronouncing, um, you, again, the case law is you can passively resist an unlawful arrest, and that's all that occurred here, Your Honor. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Mr. DeCastro, please stand. The problem with the argument that your attorney makes is it completely fails to consider the safety of the officer and the safety of the driver. The officer doesn't know who you are, and the driver doesn't know who you are. And you don't have any right to interfere with that officer doing his investigation and deciding if he wants to issue a ticket to this driver. And you are also don't have any business approaching the driver. The driver didn't ask you for help. The driver didn't say, help, help, you know. You didn't see an altercation happening between the officer and this driver. Um, the officer didn't protest that you were filming. There's no problem with filming. You can film, it's fine, all right? But you did interfere with his investigation. You did interfere with his ability to do his job. You did put him in a position where he is concerned for his safety and the safety of the driver. So I believe the state's met their burden beyond reasonable doubt. I'm going to find you guilty of obstructing a public officer and resisting a public officer. So I'd like to hear from the state and then your attorney prior to sentencing. Your Honor, in terms of sentencing, I would ask um, that a uh, defendant enter and complete a, um, an impulse control class. I would ask that the court lobby a $500 fine or the equivalent in community service. I would ask that the defendant be ordered to stay out of trouble um, for the pendency of the case. Um, and I would ask for a 90-day suspended sentence. And that's on as to each count for one concurrent. That's our request. Thank you. Your Honor, I'm asking the court to sentence the defendant to credit for time served for these offenses. Um, even if the court concludes, and, and the court did conclude that he didn't have the right to do what he did, um, I, I think the court can see that he sincerely believed uh, that, that he had the right to do so. Um, that, that's based on his past experiences and the, the training he's received in reference to the First Amendment. Um, I don't think there was any, any intent from the defendant to engage in any wrongdoing in this case, Your Honor. Um, and that being the case, especially because of the public policy interests at, at issue. So when you say he doesn't wish to engage in any wrongdoing, it seems to me from observing him in the video that he wants, he wants this. He wants to get arrested. He wants to get into an altercation with police officers. He welcomes this. This helps his YouTube channel. He called the officers here in my courtroom today pigs. He called the, and he's not his head up and down. I so apparently he hates every law enforcement officer in the United States. All right, please stand up, sir. Are you finished with your request for credit for time, sir? Um, I, I would just emphasize, Your Honor, that the defendant testified and he sincerely believes that he is providing a public service um, when he reviews and films these incidents. Um, I understand the court may have a different view of that, but when we're talking about First Amendment public policy issues such as um, supervising uh, people involved in government, I, I think that is something the court can take into consideration, not to have a show effect on that. I'll spit on that, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. DeCastro, please stand. I hereby sentence you to 90 days in the Clark County Detention Center on count one 
90 days in the Clark County Detention Center on count two to run consecutive for a total of 180 days in custody. Thank you. Sentence suspended or? Oh no, I'm going to start right now. Thank you. 